Um, this is going to be, I think, our, sh our shortest session. Um, this is on toxic gathering. You can tell there's a theme for the talks. And um, we're going to dive right into it. This is going to be familiar to you, of course. Uh, and then we'll have a Q&A after this one. OK, so we'll pro I think we'll probably just go straight into it. I, I don't see Kent here, or I, I think the elders are good with that. That'll be our plan, okay? And if you have to get up and, and, and go outside, stretch, whatever you need to do at the end of this session, just go ahead and do it. But those who want to stay in for Q&A, we'll just barrel through, and then we'll be on our way to Torchies, to in and out to the <laughs> glories of Dallas food cuisine. Can you tell I enjoy coming here? Okay, all right. I think we have sufficiently established that. Somebody at the break said, what's your bracket like? How are things going with March Madness? I know this will tell you about my level of sanctification. I do not let myself do a bracket because I get too invested in it, and I then don't enjoy March Madness. Does that give you a sense for how intense? I tore both Achilles tendons playing pickup basketball. I mean, I, I have, the kids would say I have zero chill. Okay, so the good news is sanctification is lifelong. Okay, so it's, it is good news for some of us. So uh, I, have no, I have no team I'm pulling for, but this is, this is truly madness. This is the greatest sporting event ever created, I think. Yes, the Olympics are great, but I mean, March Madness. It's like, it's, it's such a rebuke to these teams are going to be, you know, the winners. It's like, no. No, it's crazy. It's absolute craziness, and I love it. <laughs> okay, toxic gathering. Let's get, let's get <laughs> toxic March Madness. No, that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the post conference session. Okay, um, here we go. Three years ago, the world confronted a new virus, and that virus had many effects on many people. Some of you, no doubt, were affected by that virus. But COVID-19 was not the only phenomenon that arose three years ago. In an unprecedented move, as I've already alluded to, governments across the world embraced really what China pioneered, and we're all familiar with the term now, lockdowns. And if the Chinese government is doing it, that's of note, but that's probably not tilted the way of freedom and liberty and human dignity, sadly, sadly. This was the opposite of how mass illness had been treated in much of history, certainly Western history. In fact, you can go all the way back to the book of Leviticus, Leviticus 13 and other texts. Some of you will be familiar with lepers and how lepers were handled in the Old Testament, for example, and you'll know that it is not the healthy who are quarantined and shut down in the Bible itself. It is the sick. Yes, it is the sick who need real care, and we as Christians are not in any way uh, gruff about that or unfeeling or uncaring. If people are sick, we should want them to get care. I'm going to guess that many of the hospitals in this city, as with many of the hospitals in many cities and towns across this country, were founded by Christians originally. There is something in the Christian worldview, something obvious, that drives believers to want to help other people. We don't want people to uh, be in a terrible state. We want to help them. Okay, but that doesn't mean that the healthy get quarantined. It means that the sick need care, and we all seek to live wisely, of course, and love our neighbor as much as we can, but loving your neighbor does not mean, in biblical terms, being locked down and losing all freedom that you may have had. Of all the lies that were promoted to advance global lockdowns, here is the most pernicious. The gathered worship of the church is not essential. That is it. That is the worst part, I think, of the lockdowns. And I think that was probably, I don't know the playbook, a major element of Satan's strategy, and which may very well recur in years to come. You know that. This was probably a test run the last few years, and I'm no theorist of some big kind. I don't know what's going on, honestly. I really don't. But I can just see which play was run by many governments, including governments you never would have thought would do this, right? 
And I can guess that this may very well happen again, because it went pretty well, honestly. Very, very few people across the world resisted. Um, freedoms were just taken left and right. Places like Australia, which is not typically a haven of totalitarianism, became police states. I mean, you see, you remember this? <laughs> this is, this is, this just happened. And it didn't happen in just places we would expect, China or Russia or something like this. It happened in free nations and countries and states, and it was terrible. If you don't hear it from anyone else saying it that clear, um, I don't, I don't say this to be hopped up or, or controversial. I mean, there really were awful effects of this policy that many governments adopted because you don't fundamentally quarantine the healthy, you quarantine the sick in biblical terms. Here's what uh, USA Today commented on this trend of closing down worship. As the lockdown continued and marijuana dispensaries and liquor stores were deemed essential services, I can't believe I'm saying these. I can't, can, can you believe this happened? This happened. While many churches were not, were not deemed essential, many people of faith said the closures infringed on the right to the free exercise of religion. You think? <laughs> Religious groups became ever more angry when protests following the death of George Floyd, some of which quickly turned to riots where demonstrators burned, churches vandalized businesses and looted, were allowed to assemble with little to no social distancing and spotty mask wearing, end quotation. And there you have it. No, we saw this happen. We were told we not only should not, but must not gather as the church while America burned and there were mass woke marches under the banner of Black Lives Matter and others. This isn't white against black or something like that. That's not the point. Again, many of the leading voices against wokeness have been black people or African Americans. However, you term that. That's not what it's about. But fundamentally, we were locked in. Our kids couldn't forget church for a minute. Our kids couldn't go to school. You could barely get to Target or Walmart, right? I mean, we'll never forget the line into Costco. Do you remember these images? Did you stand in these lines? It was so bizarre. The entire thing did not need to happen. And there's a health that comes when we just say this together, isn't there, as believers? Something terribly unjust for all the talk of justice in our world. Something terribly unjust just happened, and it took years to come out of it and who knows what is coming. That was very hard, but you know what was very good? God used lockdowns to identify pastors, elders, and churches worth their salt. Christians now could very clearly, immediately see who was committed to expositing the word, proclaiming the gospel, caring for the sheep, evangelizing the unreached. Those churches, there were things to navigate. They didn't all handle it exactly the same way. That's not my point. My point isn't to say this one church was perfect and all the... That's not my point. There were hard questions that pastors and elders, elders faced, and, and I want to acknowledge that. But fundamentally, at least after some block of time, a lot of solid pastors and churches realized we can't keep doing this. We can't do this indefinitely. The sheep need church. We need church. You know who most wants church? God. God wants our worship. But all this was portrayed as toxic. Toxic gathering. Not loving your neighbor. Possibly transmitting a sickness. And that made worship unessential. While you could go into marijuana dispensaries or you could buy pornography and that was considered essential. So, again, our kind of collective processing here together. Very bad that that happened. Very good that God has done a new work. Something new has come out of the wokeness of the last decade, roughly, and then the lockdown. Something good has happened.
Christians have had to stand up. Christians have had to make hard choices in order to go and worship the Lord. That's not what we would have asked for, but that has been good. We should be thankful that God has used this to take down many compromised assemblies and raise up many sound churches. So Christian, as I was saying last night, if you have pastors and elders, deacons and others who, are, who have stood up and are standing up for these kind of true realities and biblical terms, thank God, and if you can, thank them. Remember, it's not easy to stand, is it? Even if you have a business and the business stayed open and business owners tried to care for their workers on a separate count and keep them going economically, give thanks to God and thank them. We need to be a thankful people. But you know what else we need to do? We need to go back to basics and we need to, we need to push back against this terrible ideology that tells us we should not gather for church it is not loving your neighbor to shut churches down. It's the very opposite. In what follows, we're going to see four main truths about this. We're going to see four truths about basically the imperative of gathering for corporate worship. Here's our first truth. The state is established by God, so we seek to obey it. The state is established by God, so we seek to obey it. 1 Peter 2, 13 and following. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him, to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up, for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. This passage and others teaches a very clear principle that we need to get down on paper. Excuse me. It teaches that as much as is possible, Christians seek to submit to governing authorities. Very carefully stated sentence. As much as is possible. So this goes against the idea that we are anarchists with a gospel twist. We're not anarchists, are we? We're not those. And, and some of us, we can see these elements in our movement where it's like, and maybe we have a special bent toward this as Americans, like, no, if the government says it, I'm doing the opposite. Yes? That's actually not really in step with Scripture, is it? That's not in step with what Peter just told us in 1 Peter 2, 13 to 17. He said, be subject or submit to every human institution, to the emperor even. The emperor in this period, of course, is not Christian. The emperor sees himself as the head of a religious cult. The emperor is effectively deified in the first century Roman world. And so, this is a strong statement at the end of 17, honor the emperor. This is not easy to do. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying this blithely. It's not easy to honor a pro-abortion to extremity, pro-trans identity uh, president like President Biden. This is not an easy task for sound Christians, but it is a calling, and it is something we must wrestle with and pursue and seek to do as much as we can, but there are going to be limits, aren't there? There are. I mean, fundamentally, Christians automatically recognize tremendous limits in not worshiping the emperor. They weren't called to worship the emperor, were they? Did, did Peter say that? No, he said, honor the emperor. The Christian who honors the governing official already is knocking them down, in many cases, several pegs, because throughout history, political leaders have sought worship. It's not uncommon. We don't worship any political leader. We worship only Christ. And so just by saying, I honor you, I honor your office, I want to seek to follow it as much as I can, but I do not worship you. That is a serious statement, actually. It may not feel that way to us, but that was not giving the, the emperor exactly what the emperor wanted. 
but neither was it descending into anarchy. The Bible teaches us, verse 14 here, that governors are sent by God to punish evil and praise those who do good. That's really the charter, the mandate of government in this world. Again, punish evil, praise those who do good. That's what government should do. That's what local officials in, in an American context, state officials, federal officials in different ways, whether Christian or not, should be about. We punish evil. We praise those who do good. Now, Peter is not meaning, though, that the government can determine what is evil and what is good, is he? He's not saying the government can flip this. He's not saying the government can take what is biblically righteous and make it unrighteous. The government does not have the freedom to do that. And so if the government says we're killing every second individual, and that's good, by the way, you as a Christian are under zero obligation. That's way too weak, isn't it? You must not follow the government in doing so, right? You must actually pray against that. You must work against it as much as we can. And that is not part of godly submission to authority that Peter is lining out. Praise God, though, that at least in American history, perhaps where you live, there have been officials, whether Christian or not, who have in some form lived out what Peter has said government should do. Where you have that, you have a rich common grace blessing as a Christian. And you don't want to underplay that. That's a blessing from God. I don't think here that we're being taught that we're going to necessarily have Christian government. There's a lot of discussion today about Christian nationalism. We can talk about that in the Q&A. I am all for, in some, I've already been asked about it like five times because <laughs> it's a very hot topic. By the way, if you're going to G3 in September, you know G3 in Atlanta, the huge reform conference, Dr. Lawson's going to be speaking there. He's spoken at every single one. Um, I'll be speaking at it. Um, others will be speaking at it. Um, we're having a pre-conference on the Wednesday before the conference starts on Thursday, and it's called The Gospel in the State, and it's about theonomy, Christian nationalism, post-millennialism, and other hot topics. Other just mild matters that no one's discussing. So we're not doing that to be controversial. We're doing it to try to, in public, think together from Scripture. We won't agree on everything, all the speakers, um, but we want to actually model. Did you know this? You can disagree without canceling each other, <laughs> by the way. Do Christians still know that? Do Christian theologians in the academy know that you can actually differ with one another without being heretics over the differences. I'm not sure we still have that in operation. Someone can be errant in their thinking and not be heretical, just so everybody knows. That's a category. But I digress. If you want to come to that pre-conference, the seminary I lead, Grace Bible Theological Seminary, in the provost role, we're putting on this before G3 conference. We'd love to have you there. Okay. I then believe that Christians should be bold, should be involved in the public square, but I don't see in Scripture the expectation that if we do what we should do, we're going to get a Christian state. And in fact, as a Baptist, I don't really want a Christian state in a certain way. I want a very Christian-influenced state, but I don't want people to think by virtue of living in my state or my nation that they are a Christian. I don't see any New Testament expectation that if, if you live in whatever country we're in, it's a good thing for you to think of yourself automatically as a Christian. You know who I want to think of themselves as Christians? People who are born again. That's, that's all I want to think they are Christians. <laughs> okay, that's a digression. We can talk about that later. It's a huge topic, but it's, a, it's, it's hot ammo these days. Second, Caesar does not regulate worship. This is a second biblical truth that we need to say today and we need to stand for, in our churches, we ourselves individually. We have just said that we should seek as much as possible to honor the emperor. We shouldn't drive on the opposite side of the road to make that practical very quickly and say we're driving on the opposite side of the road for Jesus or something like that. That's not a good policy. 
Um, we shouldn't fail to pay our taxes as Christians. We should pay our taxes as Christians. Um, there's all sorts of things we could say about how we live where we live. But we have to say, secondly, Caesar does not regulate worship. You see this in Matthew 22 um, in this passage, verses 15 to 22. The Pharisees try to trap Jesus into voicing insurrection against Caesar. So the very issue we were just talking about. The Pharisees are constantly trying to trap Jesus, which is a little picture of what Satan is trying to do with every Christian, constantly setting snares, traps, which is why we can't live passively. We have to be looking. We have to be active. We have to be taking dominion of our life in the power of the Spirit. Well, Jesus is experiencing this from the Pharisees. They try to get him to basically portray himself as anti-Caesar, and uh, we pick up in verse 18 of Matthew 22. Jesus, aware of their malice, malice, said, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. The brilliance of Jesus never ceases to amaze. Even when you've grown up in the church, as I was blessed to do, read this passage many times. They're trying to trap him, and he gets himself right out of the trap. He does two things that we need to know. He honors Caesar as basically established by God. We're not anarchists as Christians. We understand that God instituted government, and it's a part of common grace. It's a key part of common grace in the world. That's grace that everyone enjoys outside of salvation. But he secondly does a very limiting action, just like Peter did. Peter said, honor the emperor. Peter didn't say, worship the emperor. So too with Jesus. There are things that must be given to God. Those things, in fact, not only should be given to God, those things are God's. Those are God's own things. So what is that teaching us? something explosive. The Roman emperors thought they owned everything. They thought it was all theirs. Their power was unlimited. Jesus wriggles out of the insurrectionist trap where the Pharisees would get him on record as saying he's trying to lead a political revolution against Caesar, which would wipe out, lead to the wiping out of Jesus and his followers. He gets out of that trap, but what does he then do? He draws a line in the sand behind that which is Caesar's and that which is God's. What, therefore, is that which is God's? It is worship. It is what we would call congregational worship. Caesar does not rule it. Even more broadly, it's the spiritual realm ordained by God. Caesar has no jurisdiction there. That's part of my stance on the nation and the state and how Christian it's supposed to be. I want a nation or a state under God, but I don't want a nation or a state that thinks it rules the church. I don't want that. I don't want local officials telling you all at Trinity Bible how to do things. I don't want that. I, I don't want that in Conway. Um, yes, there will be some godly people in office, right? That's good, but what about when the ungodly people are in office? You have to think about both those eventualities, don't you? You do. What we want is we want to recognize these two spheres. Abraham Kuyper will call this sphere sovereignty, the great Dutch Reformed theologian, one of my favorite theologians. There's a sphere of authority that Caesar has been granted authority over, not ultimate authority, but authority under God, which is why I think under God should be in national documents and pledges of allegiance and so on. And then there's a sphere of authority where there is no ruling by Caesar. The local church orders its own worship. So this is very significant because throughout history, Caesar has tried 
to rule and regulate the church. This has even happened with some of our favorite heroes, the reformed big guys, Calvin and others. You see this in Geneva, Switzerland, where there is a very close linkage of the Genevan magistrates and the affairs of the church. And it leads to the execution of a heretic named Servetus who opposes Calvin. Now, this person should have been cast out of the church for sure, but I would in no way say we should execute heretics. That is not a New Testamental precept. Um, that is Caesar taking the sword into the church, into the worship service, and swinging. And that is the opposite of what Jesus enfranchised. When the Roman officials came to get Christ and take him to his trial and ultimate crucifixion, Peter came out swinging, didn't he? And that was not the right approach. It doesn't mean Christians don't have the right of self-defense. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how the mission of the church advances, how the church advances. We don't advance by the sword. We don't make conversions at sword point or gun point. We don't make you a formal Christian. It's, it's, a, it's a faith. I almost said it's a religion, but it's a faith of the heart. All this means then that Caesar should not shut worship down. Caesar cannot shut worship down. Could there be a situation where government officials in a time of crisis, genuine crisis, not manufactured, would recommend a quarantine or would advise churches or would work with churches to have certain measures taken? Sure, we can, we can talk about that. We can think about how in London, in the bombing blitz of the Nazis in the 1940s, 1940, and then again in 1944, how uh, I think all public buildings were supposed to have their windows darkened. I would not be one who would say, uh, okay, churches, no one can ever speak to you about that. Keep your lights all the way on and, yeah, get bombed for Jesus. No, that's not fundamentally the policy I would I would encourage, but I also would say to Caesar, if I'm advising Prime Minister Churchill, salute to Churchill, my favorite political figure in history, I would not say, non-Christian that is, non-Jesus, I would not say, hey, you take ownership of those churches and you tell them what to do. There needs to be a careful relationship there. It's like a lot of life. Anyway, that's a discussion for another day. Fundamentally, it was wrong for worship to be considered non-essential in America. That's what I'm after. On not my own philosophical grounds, we're not fundamentally philosophers in the Christian church. We have a place for philosophy, but we're fundamentally those who exposit and stand upon as best we can the Word of God. And the Word of God does not teach us that Caesar rules the church. Caesar does not rule the church. Churches seek to live in their community as best they can. You didn't build this building, or you didn't, once people started coming to this building several years ago, and now they're coming in droves, you didn't decide to move it into the middle of that street, dire, did you? You're not doing, there's no movement in the church, I'm guessing, at Trinity Bible, to move it into the middle of the street. You're on this side, right? You're not in, this, in the street. So we seek to live rightly and peaceably in our community. But Caesar does not have the right to mandate worship, shut down worship, or consider the church non-essential. This is because thirdly, thirdly, worship is due God. Again, it's just another way of saying these are the things that are God's worship. Uh, contra the way we often sing in evangelical world, worship is not from us, ultimately, is it? Worship is from God, and it bounces back to God. What an incredible privilege worship is. Worship is really what we're here for, isn't it? But our worship does not spring from our self-generated desire to do something virtuous for God that we, out of the goodness of our own intent, have decided to give to God because we're such good people. No, we're nothing, we're, we're lost, 
We're under God's sentence of condemnation, and yet God saves sinners like us and then frees us to offer worship to Him out of a joyful, captivated, doxological, meaning God-glorifying, heart. That's the foundation of worship. It's like everything else in the Christian faith. It doesn't begin or even depend on us. It begins with and depends on God. We really are here to offer people a God-entranced and God-dependent worldview where you come in from the cold, you come in from depending on yourself, you come in from setting your own priorities, you come in from living the way you want to live, you come in from living according to the lusts of the flesh and the desires of the eyes, and now you are gloriously revolutionized and now you live for the glory of God. So God is due worship. What I'm saying then is worship is a joyful duty. It's a joyful duty. It's not a grim, get angry at people on Sunday morning kind of rote thing we perform. No, worship is due God, but we get to worship God. It's just like work. We don't have to work. Stinky. We're Christians. We have to work to God's glory. No, we get to work for God, and we don't have to worship. Oh, you got to go to church again. Are we going to do this our entire life? No. We might feel that way sometimes, but we have the joyful privilege of worshiping God, and we hope that our churches structure services in such a way that joy is central, that happiness and freedom and life and hope emanates from that church. Yes, there are tough passages in Scripture and so on and so forth, but hopefully that's the mainstream of our churches. Let's not be miserable, reformed Christians or miserable, conservative Christians or miserable, Bible-loving believers. Let's be, let's strive, let's pray, let's ask God to work in us so that we're more and more and more joyful, and let's have our churches reflect that more and more. Think along the lines of Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 23 and following. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together. Here it is. Here it is. Listen, Caesar, as is the habit of son, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So it's a biblical principle, yes? We don't neglect to meet together. I don't mean there's never a week where you're traveling or something in a given year, something like that. That's not what we're after. We're talking about does the church do weekly corporate worship or not? Is this optional? Is this dependent on the local governor? Hey, governor, what do you think about this Sunday? Yes? Okay. What are you thinking about two Sundays from now? Like, you think we can gather? Are you good with that? It's not dependent on the governor. It's not dependent on anyone. It's not dependent on any elected official. God has handed this principle down. So Christians are those who don't neglect to meet together. And if COVID, if lockdowns, by the way, someone in here or someone watching online, have had the effect of, as they surely have, of pushing people away from worship, of optionalizing worship, of causing you to tune in but not really show up, not really serve, not really give, not really get to know fellow church members, not really evangelize, et cetera, and so on. Let this be a hopefully joyful call back to the goodness of the gathered body. This is not a, a neglecting to meet together, a not neglecting to, to meet together that is like in your mind. <laughs> this isn't a mental meetup like, hey, all of you, wherever you are, the author of Hebrews is saying, envision being together, and in that way, don't neglect to meet together. No, he means show up. Show up. Show up to church. That's what he means. And what what was happening in the first century? People were not doing it. Here again, we're confronting sinful tendencies, sinful patterns. It's nothing new under the sun. This has all been accelerated in America in the last few years, absolutely. It's time to come back to church if you haven't. 
Um, you have to be careful, some of us, for health conditions, that's valid. But in general, if you can come, you want to come. But even in the first century, about 2,000 years ago, people were not doing this. This is a tendency. This is a pattern of, of the heart that some fall into. You've got to fight that. You've got to pray to God. Please, Lord, my heart isn't in like, you know, the central place of joyful, abundant worship right now. I mean, how often, do you ever notice this? How often it is that you want Sunday morning, for example, to be like, ah, moving from strength to strength spiritually. Children, I'm so glad that you have gotten the cereal you needed to get in a timely fashion. And yes, child, that dress looks great on you. It's a great, you don't need to change it five separate times. No, that's perfect. And you and I, spouse, we need to talk through this, but ah, oh, it will go so peaceably and there will be no hurt feelings in these three and a half minutes we have to talk together. This is wonderful. And we will drive to the service and it, it will just be as if we are buoyed on a cloud <laughs> carrying us all the way right into the doorstep of worship. And we will greet fellow saints with joy and gentle hugs, and it will be all perfect. Is that often the way it goes? It often feels like you're a barnstorming baseball team, like crabby. These ones are delayed. These ones are, are bickering over something. Somebody kicked somebody in the van or the SUV when they were walking past to sit in their seat on the way to the church. You're having marital communication that is probably not at an ideal level, and now you've got to go into church and you've got to work it out, and this is real life, is it not? Can we just be real life Christians? We need to be, don't we? And I'm guessing there's probably some kind of diabolical energy just toward making Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights or whatever it is as, as complex as it can get. So we can work on those dynamics for sure. We can try. We can talk through these things as married couples. We can try to prep our kids and train our kids and get them ready and all these sorts of things. Fundamentally, we're often going to go to church, and it's not necessarily going to be a hundred of a hundred, is it, on the excitement scale on the excellent parenting scale. Choose your metric. But nonetheless, the Word of God says, don't neglect to meet together. Why does it say that? It doesn't just say that. Clauses in the Bible matter. What is it going to say? But encouraging one another. <sighs> Isn't that vital? There is not a surplus of encouragement then in the first century when things are very hard for Christians, right? This is an embattled little body of believers that are being written to. They're called exiles. And things are not easy now. And lots of the sheep are fighting discouragement. Lots of you in all sorts of different forms are fighting discouragement. Preachers and teachers don't offer a little pill that you take and it solves all your problems on Sunday morning and you never have them again, right? But what we do have as believers is gathered worship and the Bible tells us it's there to encourage us. It's there to encourage us. It's what it says in this passage. Church should be encouraging. Church should have an encouraging feel. It, it, pastors will get into different registers and there are, are strong words and there are wor imperatives and there's warnings and uh, there's a lot to say there. But fundamentally, what does the author of Hebrews say? Church is there for the encouragement of Christians. It doesn't just mean a pat on the back. It means encouragement in these glorious truths of the Christian faith so that you go in, yes, on a good number of weeks and you are weary and you are burdened. And everything isn't perfectly sealed shut in your life, in your home, in your family, in your job, and so on. But you come in, and for just an hour, hour and a half, two hours, depending on how reformed you are, you come in, <laughs> joke, and you get rich encouragement, and you hear again that there's a heavenly Father who shouldn't love you by rights, but does in Christ in the power of the Spirit, and you come out, and you really are. It's not all been made right yet. 
That's when Jesus returns and makes it all right. It's not all ironed out. It's not all resolved in your life. But yet, you have drunk the living water. That's what it's for. You might think I'm just riffing on a theme. I'm not. This is why you can't shut worship down. This is why it's not optional. It is essential. It's not just essential because God said it. It is. That's true. It's also essential because it has a function. It lifts up a people whose eyes are drooping as the week goes on. Church is here for many reasons, but a key one is to lift up our eyes to the hills from whence comes our help. Not some of us, all of us. Worship is essential. Fourth, worship is costly. This is my final truth. We are almost concluded with this conference. Worship is costly. It's not how we think about worship, especially in America. Because, I mean, look, look around. There's, there's still churches on every corner. Yes, church buildings at least. And um, there are harmful effects of that because sometimes people can think they're a Christian and they're not a Christian, right? It's actually not a good thing. But there are all sorts of glorious effects that have taken place in America because of the freedom we have, because of things like free speech, because of religious liberty. If you're working for those things very quickly in your vocation, that is a, that is a high calling to preserve free speech and religious liberty and these sorts of things. Christians should care about these realities, and we should fight for them, not against flesh and blood, but we should fight for them. They matter. But we've got to just know that even if you have a context like this where we've had such tremendous freedom to worship, thank you, God, it's still costly. The Bible teaches us there's going to be a cost. Not when you worship in a really angry or aggressive way. We're worshiping hard over here, and so then you're going to draw fire. No, just for worshiping the living God in a world where there is a real devil who roams the earth like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, trying to shut down the work of the church, trying to destroy Christian marriages, trying to destroy Christian families, trying to destroy the unborn made in God's image, where there is a real devil trying to get young boys and girls to think that they're trapped in the wrong body and warp their body irrevocably and change themselves and think of themselves in a blasphemous pagan identity, where there is a real enemy, a roaring lion, there's going to be opposition to worship. We can't be Pollyanna-ish about this. We can't expect that if we just, no, we're loving. We're not against anyone. We want to worship God to encourage the flock, the things we were just talking about. We can't expect nonetheless that there will be no wind in our face. Look uh, or think with me about Acts 5. We, we don't have time to read it. Acts 5 is um, quite a passage. It's where the apostles are called before, Peter and the apostles are called before the Jewish high council, and the high council demands that they not preach the gospel in Jerusalem any longer. Allow me to just list a few phrases we read in, in Acts 5, in this passage, Acts 5, 17 to 42. You could look at this in the whole book of Acts. What does worship occasion? What response does it get? And it would be quite a study. Verse 17, the high priest rose up, all who were with him, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, public official, Jewish official, Filled with jealousy, who has a lot of public power, political power, they arrested the apostles and put them in prison. Track that. So, just preaching the gospel, standing for Christ, makes a Jewish official, very powerful one, be filled with jealousy. We rarely think about what role jealousy has inside the church and outside. It is an absolute viper. It is a poison gas that we hardly ever talk about, but it is deadly. Okay, filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles. They're thrown in prison. They're imprisoned for worship. Is this new? It's not new. 
this instinct to shut worship down. It's ancient. Verse 26, then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. Okay? Literally, they're picking up stones to try to kill these Christians, the, the surrounding people. There are mobs one after another in the book of Acts that, that are formed for one purpose, to kill Christians. It's not new. It's not something even that especially aberrant. This, this is well established as a response to worship. Verse 29 but Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. You and I seek to season our speech with graciousness as much as we can. We're all a work in progress there. And yet, note the clear stakes that are playing out in Jerusalem. We ultimately, this is what we were talking about earlier, can't obey you over God. We have to obey God over you. If you tell us we can't worship, we can't preach, we can't evangelize, we're done. You, you, may, you may do your worst to us, but we are not here to preserve our own lives. We're not here to keep our jobs. We're not here to keep padding the retirement account. We are here to worship Christ. That's why we're here, and that's what the apostles voice. Verse 33, when they heard this, the onlookers, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. Proclaiming Christ, standing for Christ in this passage means people get enraged against you and want to kill you. These are strong words I'm saying, but honestly, brothers and sisters, this is just Bible. It's just basic. Verse 41, last, then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. What a close to this passage. Peter and the apostles are suffering. It's not high times. It's hard times. But they don't leave this whole scene and whine. They don't complain. They don't freak out. They don't tear their garments. What do they do? They do what Christians really are called to do. They rejoice. They rejoice specifically that they have the high calling, not of preserving their life by any means necessary, but of reminating the glory of God, of bearing the name of God and standing for God in an evil world. So remember this, worshiping God, worshiping the true God, worshiping Christ, may have felt neutral, at, maybe at best in America. It's never been neutral. Worshiping God does draw fire. <laughs> the way the lockdowns were framed, it was a health crisis. It was a health crisis that you had to love your neighbor through by blindly following whatever government said to do. Please hear me. There is no true love of neighbor, second commandment, without love of God, first commandment. There is no love of God without obeying what God has said to do. God has said to worship Him and not forsake it. So you are not loving your neighbor by shutting down church. You love your neighbor, if necessary, standing against the world, speaking the truth in love. That is the way to love your neighbor. Loving your neighbor, friends, we're going to keep hearing this, and compromised evangelicals are going to keep shaming us in, in these lines. I'm, I'm sad to say, you do not love your neighbor when you follow lies. You don't love anybody when you stand on lies. You can only love people in biblical terms when you stand on the truth. So love is first and foremost about what is true, and only then is it about a posture or a disposition, as it is. We want to be as gracious, kind, loving, tender, meek, gentle as we can be, but we have to always stand on the truth. If we're not living by the truth, nobody's getting loved, no matter what people say. Concluding applications. 
very quickly. First, let's seek to honor the government. <laughs> this is not easy. <laughs> I've already acknowledged that. But the Bible still speaks as much as we can. Remember that principle? Second, let's never let Caesar regulate our worship. If this arises again, as it did in the first century, this instinct to shut down the church is not new. If it comes back in our days, resolve that Caesar is not ruling the church, not out of obstinacy and ungodliness and crankiness, out of fidelity to God. And even if tons of other evangelical churches do capitulate, leave a witness, leave a witness for history that we will not all bow the knee to Caesar. The Puritans in the 17th century who got ejected, the pastors who got ejected from their churches, but then came back and were under penalty of law and formed small groups, small churches, and, and, and ministered to their flock any way they could, and tons of them got thrown in prison. Some of them died under those circumstances. John Bunyan was imprisoned and absent from his large family for much of his children's growing up years because of this resolve that like those faithful Puritans, we will leave a witness. Resolve that we will be like the faithful Canadian brothers, the pastors up there who kept their churches open under penalty of law. One church in eastern Canada, Trinity Bible Chapel, has accrued something like $40 million in fines. One church in western Canada, James Coates's church, Grace Life, uh, saw their, pr their pastor be sent to prison. Tim Stevens, another Canadian pastor, was also sent to prison. American evangelicals barely talked about it. Whole podcasts and ministries dedicated to public theology and how you live out the gospel barely said a word or, or even, even worked against those Canadian Christians. And that was a line. It, it, this isn't about obstinacy. This isn't about conservative politics. Ultimately, this is about the glory of God. This is about faithful brothers and sisters, many congregants who suffered the last several years in Canada, and very few Americans even took note. Well, let us be those who take note, who pray for persecuted Christians, and who ourselves get ready. Let's get ready. Third, let's worship God in high or low times. Let's worship God in high or low times. This is not dependent on our feelings. Faith is not driven by your feelings. Faith involves your feelings. God has given us feelings. God is in the process of renewing our feelings, and we feel much that God wants us to feel as Christians. But worshiping God is not dependent on what you feel. You oftentimes won't feel like worshiping God. Worshiping God is dependent on what is true. Fourth and finally, Let's show the world that worship is worth any cost. It's worth any cost. That is actually, brothers and sisters, as I close and as we wrap up these four sessions and move into Q&A, that is actually exactly how disciples often have gotten made in church history. It's not by embracing lies. It's not by dropping back and going silent when, when there's controversy you just, you just go silent as a Christian. You just pull back. We understand that instinct. But actually, the way the gospel has really advanced throughout history is by some Christians paying a price, a heavy price. Do you know why the gospel advances in those circumstances? Because people see, oh, this isn't prosperity religion. <laughs> this isn't people following God because their life gets better automatically when they follow God. These people are following God in persecution and even unto death. And we collectively as the American church have got to embrace such a mindset. I don't mean that we're all going to get persecuted horribly or we're all going to die. I wouldn't imagine that would be the case. It could be. Whatever God brings... We need to know that disciples get made 
when Christians take stands and speak the truth in love. Let's be those kind of Christians by the grace of God. Heavenly Father, help us to live out these words. We all falter and stumble. We all can think of not just the government opposing us in a very public way. We all can think of evangelistic conversations we could have had and we didn't. So we are not the strong ones in this partnership. You are. You are the strong one. We pray that you would embolden us and help us and change us and bless us and ready us for whatever you have coming. And Father, I pray that your church will be purified and will stand and that you will get great glory and that you will make many disciples as your church gathers, even gathers under the knife. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. So we're going to start the Q&A. We're going to have, if anybody has a question, we're going to let you step forward to this microphone um, and get in line. And if the line's not too long, we'll see how long we go. And thank you again. It's awesome. All right. The firing squad. Here we go. Honor my wife. <laughs> wow, that was intense. Uh, I told you to do it. I just wanted to say what a joy it has been to have Bethany here. And you've seen me. Seriously, I, I said this last night. Thank you. She is my helper. She helps me so much. She is pure joy. I love her so much. And you've seen, in all seriousness, that the Lord seems to have given me some hard truths to say. I'm not exactly sure why, but he has. And that's not always easy for me, and it's not always easy for my wife, but she is such a support and a blessing to me. So I just want you to know that. And please, um, if you think of us, pray for us, because ministry for anyone, not just us, but ministry is not, is not easy. It's not supposed to be. Um, so it's not just me and Bethany. But um, we, just, we just would uh, ask for your prayers, that we would, we would stand and we would love one another well, and um, that God would use nothing burgers like us for his glory. That's a technical theological term. Okay, so I love you, Bethany. I love you very much. All right. Did I honor my wife sufficiently? Are you going to, are you going to, I didn't mean you had to clap, but if you want to yell at me again, you can yell at me again. Um, I'll give you permission. All right, here we go. Yes, sir. This Doug, we're on. My name is Doug. Thanks for the, uh, the conference. Um, it was very informative. I have my own perspective on this topic, but I wanted to ask. I thought you may mention that probably for time's sake. What's your perspective on Anna Nicole Jones's 1619 project? Ah, uh, okay, the 1619 project. Um, there is racism in the American past, and there are, tragically. Um, a f th there is a serious pull toward thinking that white people are superior, European people are superior at the time of the American founding. Um, so that is a part of our history. It's not the happy part. Um, it is part of our history. Our history as a country, though, doesn't reduce only to that in such a way that that's all we should teach about American history. There's a lot of good in American history, too, just generally. And then we also can't be naive about the way the world works. There is what we would call racism, though there are not many races. There is what we would call partiality, the biblical term I surfaced, in most cultures in human history. There is that human tendency to think we are superior to outsiders. So, what, what wokeness does is it teaches Americans wrongly that we're the only ones who have sinned along these lines, even with the slave system, for example, and it's not true. Slavery, slavery was very common throughout global history. Slavery was almost the norm, and, um, and a lot of that slavery was based on people thinking they were superior to other peoples. So, 
much more to say, but I do not commend the 1619 Project in any way, even as I strive in my book. You can see it, and, and please take all the books. The church graciously uh, provided them for you. But I, you can see in chapter 7 of the book how I handle American history a little more. Thank you. Sure. Hey. My hey. Name's Elaine. I want to thank you for coming, Trinity. Elders, thanks for bringing me the um, My question is uh, book recommendations. So my friend Erica and I, um, a couple years ago, started a book club, and several are here, and we've enjoyed reading a variety. The women in the group are 39 to 71 years old, um, 8 to 10 of us, about every other month. Christian, I think the only non-Christian author we've read is Irreversible Damage. Um, okay. Probably the book that most would say was impactful in their lives was J.C. Wilde's Holiness. So, if that gives you an idea, it's kind of where we're okay. heading. But I just love book recommendations. I thought I'd ask. So, this is for general book recommendations, not wokeness, or it's just general. Right. Your book would fit perfectly. Several have already read it, so we okay. won't reread the group. But. Okay. Um, uh, Christianity and Liberalism by J. Gresham Machen is, is a pretty short book, but it's, uh, it's an excellent book for showing about 100 years ago that the social gospel was distinct from the true gospel. And that's actually what I titled my book after, Christianity Wokeness. I was consciously trying to mimic Machen, not that I'm at his level or even close. Um, so that's a good worldview book. Vody Bauckham's book, Fault Lines, is, is very helpful. I'm guessing you're on that. Um, I wrote another book called Reenchanting Humanity. That's a doctrine of mankind. Um, wow, book recommendations. J.I. Packer's Knowing God is an excellent book. Um, it, for, for those of you who want to think more about politics and economics, Wayne Grudem has a book called Politics According to God. I think that's the title. And then he has another book on economics. So, you know, you could push out of the normal categories. We Christians can feel a little bit weird if we start reading about economics. Can, are we even allowed to do that or politics? But it's really good to, to get into some of that material. Um, I'd recommend Abraham Kuyper's Lectures in Calvinism as an approach to sphere sovereignty. I'd rec recommend Jonathan Edwards' sermon series, Charity and Its Fruits which you can get in book form. There's some books. I could just stand here and just talk about books all day, which is... I have one more, I have one more, I have one more, I'm sorry. Um, this is not Christian, but it's about Winston Churchill, who was raised up in God's providence to really save the free world, as you may be aware. And the Last Lion trilogy is an excellent series of books. And so if you wanted a book about courage in hard times, volume two of the Last Lion trilogy is excellent because Churchill, as many of you will know, was really the only political figure in the West who saw what was coming with the Nazis and Hitler, and he paid a brutal price in common grace terms for standing against it in public. And I have found his example so inspiring. Thank you very much. There's a last one. Thank you. Hi, my name is Andrew. Uh, hey. I wanted to ask, because obviously uh, most of these sessions covered the idea that American society is on the decline. We've, I mean, even from the very first one, uh, even with, with uh, the, the idea of toxic mas masculinity, and you spoke several times about what courageous men have gone out into the world and done, not just in American context, but globally. And, uh, the idea of, of you know hard times creating strong men and strong men creating good times, good times. But at, at some point, I, mean, I think history is replete with examples of those those good times that create weak men. What ends up creating the strong men again? War, conflict, that sort of thing. Yeah. But then we also have situations where you'll say, you know, even with worship is costly. And I wrote it here. We are here to worship, not necessarily live our most comfortable lives or preserve our lives. You speak of Winston Churchill, saved the free world using violence. Uh, we, you know, our own American Revolution was violent in nature. So in, kind of on the American nationalism front, but you know, in a society where we're starting to look at it and say, when is the time to, and I know this is supercharged here, take up arms, you know, as it were. Mm. What is a biblical framework that you would use to discern between 
uh, true, uh, you know, self self defense. Somebody, you know, government official comes and says, "I'm taking your kids from you yeah. uh, because you're preaching the gospel." You know, I can blast them. Versus uh, deciding, hey, as a society, we've had enough of this godless ideology. We do want to fight back using some violence. Where, how do we use the Bible to find out when it's appropriate and when it's not? Good question. There is no revolutionary imperative in the New Testament. And the most revolutionary action that is taken that I can think of is, is when Peter cuts off the servant of the high priest's ear. And Jesus rebukes him for doing so. So something horrific, the, the worst evil that's ever been committed is being done because this is now the, leading to the crucifixion of the Son of God. Um, and yet Jesus doesn't say, stop this, stop what they're doing from happening. He embraces that. So we're not fundamentally a people who understand ourselves as launching revolutions all over the place. We're a people who, as Peter lays out, are seeking to obey Caesar as much as is possible. And the first century church is under dire circumstances in many cases, and, and there's no New Testamental call to rebel. So we want to be very slow to have that instinct, but we also have to recognize that when the government switches what is evil and what is good, we are in hard times, and we now face severe challenges, and that's why you got the clear note, at least I hope you did, um, in terms of my communication ability, that we have to obey God rather than men. Um, but we're not getting there, we're not getting to a place of rebellion or revolution easily. Um, w w I, there's, there's no imperative that would tell us to start planning that. What we would need to do is recognize that, again, if evil is being called good and good is being called evil, then we're in hard times and now we have to obey God rather than men. And that's, what, that's why I referenced the Canadian churches. They didn't lead an uprising in the society, the, the pastors, I mean, they kept their churches open. I think that's really what I would say they needed to do. Now, the Canadian truckers enacted a peaceful blockade across the country, and now you're just squarely in gray area territory there. Is that evil? I, don't, I wouldn't say what they did was wrong, personally. I'm putting myself on record here. It's a dangerous thing. But um, was, it, was it the only thing Christians could ever do? I don't think so. It's gray area. It's hard. Um, I was personally thankful that in a peaceful way, they protested. And I'm, I'm for that on righteous grounds. When it, in terms of it coming to actual revolution, very hard question. And that's why Christians and historians and theologians and ethicists debate endlessly the American Revolution, right? But what you could say at the very least is that the British government was um, making what is good evil and what is evil good. But you'd be in gray area there. You're not in clear, I would say, biblical territory like that was a great revolution or that was pure evil. I don't know. It's hard. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. So, not much clarity in conclusion. Okay, great. <laughs> Give you your money's worth here. These are hard issues, aren't they? Hi. is a real health threat that, uh, and there are people who are in those vulnerable categories, the elderly or uh, infirm or overweight or something like that, which, which this virus really did target. And so I, there is a clear place, biblical warrant, for um, being careful in special forms um, in those circumstances. So let that be said. But fundamentally, worship is not supposed to be virtual. It's supposed to be in person. It's a corporate gathering of the body of Christ in local expression. 
and we are those who have been freed from the fear of death. So here again, we're in a gray area, right? If somebody's, I don't know, somewhat in jeopardy of getting this virus and this virus could end their life, what degree of measures are they taking? It, it, there's Christian freedom, frankly. What we're not free to do, though, let this be said, on the other side, is fear death, is fear death. We live wisely, that's righteous, but we don't fear death. And that, I think, is what a lot of us did fall prey to. That's what our culture lives by. It lives really by the fear of death nowadays. That's what, that's what COVID exposed, really. It's not wrong to try not to die, but it is wrong to have that be your functional idol Christians know that Hebrews 2, 14 to 18, Jesus has tasted death for us. Jesus has conquered death. So we're actually, that's part of the free to worship element. We don't fear anything anymore. We're freed from all those fears. Now we slip into that, as I've tried to be realistic about throughout the weekend. We slip into fear. But fear has no objective hold over us. Its hold is broken, just like death has lost its sting. Um, so we need, to, we need to share that message, speak the truth in love with friends and church members who may even still be not gathering with the body. And they need to be lovingly called back, I would say, to corporate worship. And we just as a church need to, need to be exercised of the fear of death. If there's another virus, if another one comes, okay, let's say in two years, we should live wisely. We should operate by biblical principles, not by any state dictatorship's principles, and we should live as those who do not fear death, and that will itself be a witness. So, that's, so lovingly engage those people, encourage them to come back to church, indicate to them that they're not following God's Word if they're just consistently not showing up. Tell them it's, there's no sense of the church being you yourself by yourself for a long-term situation, certainly when there is an existing body, um, you need to go with your church. Sh sh tell them that. Sure. I don't have stats to give you like off, off my, the top of my mind, but I definitely think, sadly, we saw that a lot of people who seem to be Christian and thus seem to have worshiping God as a, the highest priority of their life don't have it as the highest priority of their life. And so that's sad. On the other hand, it's had that effect of, in a provisional way, showing who is a believer, at least as far as we can tell, who's committed to these things and who is not. So there's a, there's a really sad form of that, and then there's a really positive form of that where, honestly, a lot of Reformed or Bible-preaching churches that may historically have had 50, 100, 150 members in the last few years have skyrocketed, you know, and they're almost unable to handle the growth just because they're biblically faithful. So um, that's encouraging. Yeah. Good question. Hi. Um, it's just really beautiful to be able to use like scripture to combat this idea of wokeness, and especially just seeing unbelievers hear scripture for the first time and change their opinions on that. Like I was blessed with that many years ago. But I, I find these unfortunate circumstances where Christian churches fall victim to these ideas and they form to the world. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's a barrier talking to them because scripture is not or like they say, like, this, this is no longer relevant, like, everything needs to change the times. Yeah. How do you encourage having these same exact discussions with those people who are familiar with Scripture, but have, like, re 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 basically? Yeah. There's really no amazing solve for that situation. We know that we have to, 1 Timothy 4.16, watch our life and our doctrine closely not like the squish, squish bots out here, but everybody has to watch their life and doctrine closely because we all have a tendency to drift in some way. So if we're moral realists, as I've been urging throughout this little event, we've got to know that 
brothers and sisters are going to drift. We ourselves are going to drift, and it is God's grace to bring the ministry of truth to us and, and shock us, frankly, and, and get a hold of us, and for God the Father to not just wake us up, but also in that um, parable of the prodigal son sense, Luke 15, run toward us. When we ran away from God, God runs toward us. So, the way, <coughs> excuse me, we can enact that ministry with straying brothers and sisters is to minister the truth to them. I mean, that's what I know to do. That's why I've done what I've done here and presented the content I presented. I have no fancy ideas. I have no genius insights. I am no, you know, bright, sharpest pencil in the drawer or something like this. All I have to do is stand on the Word of God, offer it to people, and trust that the Holy Spirit will persevere with all those who are truly saved and, and bring them back. So that's, that's your call. Your call is not to um, sand down the biblical message so that it's more palatable or more acceptable. Your call is not to fall silent so that nobody dislikes you and you just keep the peace. Your call is just to keep speaking the truth in love and trust that God will use it, and he will. Amen. <laughs> Hugely contributed, yes. Um, a fair portion of the American church has been seeker-sensitive and intentionally so for generations now. And so in a seeker-sensitive model, truth is not paramount. It's really what brings people in that is paramount. And then you give them as much truth. I'm, I'm reading this in the best light that I can. You give them as much truth as you think they can handle. But as even Willow Creek and Bill Hybels have acknowledged in the last 10 or 12 years, that model that, that Willow Creek in Illinois pioneered really, or didn't pioneer, but drove to a massive degree successfully, that model has not yielded strong, tough, enduring disciples. In a lot of contexts in America, it's honestly not that hard to get 1,000 or 2,000 or lots more thousands people to show up. Um, for whatever reason, um, seeker-sensitive, theologically minimal Christianity actually plays pretty well. <laughs> you, can, you can get a pretty big audience and make a pretty good living for yourself as a preacher, but that does not mean you've made true disciples. Now, the, the other side of that would be you're so cranky about seeker sensitivity that you would have this kind of angry congregation and you would have a total of 11 people showing up, not because that's just who God has providentially allotted through a faithful ministry, but because really there are some issues. And we have those kind of churches and we have to watch ourselves if we are, we just tend to err on truth or grace, don't we? We just do. We tend to err on one side or the other. And if we see seeker sensitivity as a real cancer, as it is, we just have to make sure we don't become the frozen chosen, the angry reformed, who can only talk about how evil everything is. I'm not assuming that is your case at all. I'm just saying, I've seen even in my own ministry, like, I've got I've to work hard. I don't want to drift. I drift too. I've got to work hard to bring truth and grace together, John 1.17. So hopefully as we do that, we won't just scald the seeker-sensitive people or whatever you want to call them. Ho hopefully we will call out error, but we will present an appealing, joyful, loving Christianity uh, that is grounded in the truth and that um, can be a harbor for people. Thank you so much. Yeah. How do we as Christians effectively uh, stand up in the workplace, but also honor our employees? I think you are the 
Uh, that's a very important question. Is it Kiefer? Yeah. Kiefer. You're very, Im uh, I almost said you are a very important question. <laughs> strange, that's a strange sentence. Um, that's what you're getting at 11.53 at the end of this event. You are a very important proposition, Kiefer. Okay, sorry. No, in all seriousness, there's not really going to be any fancy formula that I know of. When you've got DEI training, um, when you've got ESG ideology, I think you can ask questions in, in the setting, in the HR training session or whatever it is about the latest woke policy. You can ask questions. Um, and I think you can be a voice for truth. But you've got to know, in being that, you're potentially in jeopardy. But now, here again, we're in a gray area, aren't we? How much witness is a Christian called and required to offer when in Babylon? What are the lines? What do we do? What I would say is we need more preaching about Joseph. His church had some. Um, we need more preaching about Daniel. We need more preaching about Esther and those kind of biblical figures. That won't give us a, you know, A plus B plus C equals Y formula, but it will inspire us. It will remind us that followers of God have been in these really hard places. It will drive us to pray and seek to be wise about when we speak. That is a biblical principle, but it will also leave us with the imperative of witness. You think of John the Baptist in Matthew 14, 1 through 12. You've got Herod, who is in a sexually compromised relationship with a family member, ungodly uh, relationship, and John the Baptist, who was not there to preach public ethics, who's there to be the forerunner of the Messiah, repeatedly, the text indicates in the Greek, called Herod out publicly for his sin and ended up beheaded for it. So, I see us as having, in fundamental terms, the requirement to speak rather than be silent, even as I recognize it is wise and right to pray for wisdom and guidance and to, to speak in the, in the right time as best we can. That's what I would say. Okay. Yeah, good question. reflects my very strong burden to present Christianity as a worldview, which answers all the questions. I don't mean some of the questions. It answers all the questions. It doesn't answer them all in the way we naturally expect in our flesh, but it answers them all. So, it answers on the question of work, the dignity of work. How do we find meaningful work in this world? That's a huge question for people, unbelievers. Well, we have the answer. Um, the Bible answers the question, the Christian worldview answers the question of what does it mean to be human? It means to be made in the image of God in fundamental terms. So, you're made by God to know God for God's glory. That's what we're here for. We don't live that out righteously in Adam. But, but um, I want to I say these things every chance I get. I want to have conversations over economics and politics. And we, you and I, we never… We're always bearing down on the gospel, like you rightly said, but we never know what it's going to be that's going to trip the wires of somebody and lead them into the kingdom. It might be they've always approached work as drudgery or just, you know, work for the weekend or work for big toys or whatever it may be that you can have fun with, and, and you as a Christian show up and you're working unto God's glory, and they're like, what is that, you know? We never… God, this, God is in the saving business, not us. We present the truth every chance we get. It's like with our kids. 
We don't, we don't exactly know when our kids, at least some of the time, cross the line of faith. There's, there's no 17-step there's no mechanism I'm aware of where I do these things and my kid becomes a, a Christian. What we're doing is we're supposed to train our kids, Deuteronomy 6, all throughout life, right? And just give them as much truth as we can give them in a loving way, not, not in a burdensome, stuffing them way. But then we are absolutely leaving it to the Lord. We, we call them to repentance and faith. We pray for that for them, even with them. But we leave that to the Lord, and we don't ramp up the pressure on them in an artificial way, in a finite way, to right now close the deal. We actually don't want to make forced conversions. As much as we want our kids or our coworkers, same thing, to be saved, we very closely don't want to make them a false convert for any bad reason. So I don't want my kids to feel pressure to be a Christian when they're, they're not a Christian. I'm praying for that to sync up, for them to feel they're a Christian at the time they are a Christian. And, and in a similar way with coworkers or friends or neighbors or whatever it may be, I feel free based on the sovereignty of God to present the truth of God, the gospel of God, and, and, and even to call for faith and repentance. But it's not up to me. And there's so many, I think, even Reformed people, even a burden for revival can translate to, honestly, almost Arminian pressure on us to get the job done. There's good revival and there's less helpful revival. Let that be said. But I, I, I'm a guy who, as I get older, I'm like, I don't want that. I don't want to crank up the intensity and make... Uh, at least potentially false converts. I live uh, probably, you know, experience some bumps down the line along these lines, but I want to be the guy who really and truly does live by my theology from Scripture, and I trust God to save. And so my duty, like we talked about earlier with the previous gentleman, my duty is just to present as much truth and grace as I can, and God sends the Spirit where it wishes, John 3, not me. That is true for my children, my friends, my co-workers, everyone else. Hi, everyone. My name is Dennis. Hey, and before I get to my question, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for being the champion for the truth. Uh, this conference is such a blessing. I would say try to have conversations with church leaders because that's a good thing to do. That's an edifying and godly thing to do. Not, again, as if you and I, it's not just evangelism, right, but n not in a way that we can change their heart single-handedly, but we present what we know to be true as best we can, and we pray for them, um, and then we leave it to them and we, we see what they do. And if there's not repentance and change, then we find a new church because life is too short to sit under unsound doctrine. And so we, we find a new church. And, and that can feel very, you know, yeah. And then when it gets worked out, and you lose the relationships, and your kids don't have the, the youth program you had, and your wife doesn't have the friendships, and you don't have the friendships, and oof, down the road it can set in that this was a very consequential decision. This was very hard. So I just would say there can be a real appropriate, like, we've got to stand on the truth, action, but we just have to count the cost and know. That doesn't mean hold back 
from a godly action, godly course of action. It just means know that this, these things are often messy and hard, but we have to ultimately stand. Members are such a key part of churches. It's not just pastors and elders. Members are huge in a church, and a membership that loves and stands for and backs and supports sound doctrine is everything uh, to, a church's, to a church's health when there are godly leaders as well. So be part of that. Give your energy not to trying to, you know, form little rafts off a sinking ship, but if there's not change, find a new ship and put your family there and go with gusto. That's what I would say. Thank you, John. Absolutely. the guy who's like got the least words to say on things, so, uh, so you should know that. But I don't, I, I, it seems to me like from the ministry of Christ and the apostles, from Old Testament prophets, from a figure like Elijah, it seems to me like the ministry of truth is what God has us in this for. Whereas I think in a lot of corners of the modern American evangelical church, speaking truth is like one of 30 things on a rotating wheel of priorities. There has got to be more than just bold truth-telling. <laughs> For a Christian to be a sound Christian, there's got to be the fruits of the Spirit, right? And then for a church to be a sound church. So there are lots of priorities. There are lots of things to work on. There is a lot that needs to change. The truth people have their own failings and weaknesses just as the other side does. But if there is no ministry of truth to people, to family members who are posting graphics about how the real crisis, the real tragedy of Nashville is this transgender shooter, I mean, you, I, I don't, I, it's a gray area. I keep saying that. It's a gray area. What do you say? How much do you say? How much do you engage? We need the spirit. We need prayer. We need wisdom. But just as a body of believers, somebody has to speak truth. That's what we're here for. We're, we're here to love God, which means, at least in part, standing on the truth and love our neighbor. How do you love your neighbor? At least in part, by telling them the truth. We're not loving our neighbor by being quiet all the time. We're not loving our neighbor by not saying what's true. We're not loving our neighbor by not clarifying things. And that's, that's what has been so hard in the last five years of the Reformed world and the evangelical world is how m we have so many ministries. We have so many podcast followers. We have so many social media people. And yet, there's so few leaders who will say, this is the line. This is truth. This is falsehood. Not out of anger or hate, but out of love. It's, it's disheartening, to be honest with you, but we've got to be those people who out of love speak truth. And so I guess, I don't know, I don't know, brother, I don't, know, I don't have the grid to give you to say, here's when you should give that Facebook comment or, you know, here's when you should pipe up around the dinner table. I don't know. I just can tell you, like, Jesus was full of grace and truth, and that's what we're supposed to be full of. And all through the Bible and the New Testament, God's people are a speaking people. The book of Acts is a speaking church. And that's why it gets in such big trouble. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, we got three more folks, and then we are, we are officially shut down. Oh, oh, oh. We got four. <laughs> she came in at the 11th hour, but... She still gets in. It's the same. She still speaks. Okay, yeah, sorry. 
Thanks again, Alan, for speaking. Uh, I know that in the first talk, you talked about how men are not encouraged very much. I just want to publicly, uh, others have already been so, but just publicly encourage you and Thank you. let you know that we are thankful. Uh, I was struck at reading, I think it was in Revelation, where it talks about those who don't inherit the kingdom. One of the first things it will say is power. Mm. I think that a lot of that has to do with where we're at today. It's not so much that things aren't clear of what is right or wrong, but it just takes courage to just say what is right or wrong. And it also is easier whenever it's maybe just the kind of quote unbelieving world, but when it is dealing with the church, that's like a lamentable thing. Yeah. It's like Jesus looking on Jesus and saying how like how mm. awesome like, I want to like have it. Right? So when you ever you're having it with my brothers and sisters, that's very hard. And so can you speak kind of very gracious and it <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Uh, as a kind of observation and a question with it, uh, with CRT or critical race theory, it seems like it's a little bit of a two pronged approach where CRT basically breaks down the individual. Obviously, if we talk about it's primarily towards a majority group, the white person who mm is -hmm. an American context. But it will break down the individual on one hand, and then you have what can we call a queer theory or just really any of the sexual that come alongside on the other hand essentially says, let me build you back up. This is taking away your voice on one, right. and therefore, you know, kind of sit down and shut up. And then that makes more of a temptation or something more attractive to come along and say, here's this other thing that you can identify as. It then basically gives you that voice back. Sure. And so I didn't know if that, if, kind of if your thoughts on that, if you something to agree with, or if you might add more or less to it. Or yes. I agree with that. I think that's well said. I like your formulation. It's a, it's a replacement theology, as I say in this book, Christianity and Wokeness. So this wokeness is built off of, like Marxism more generally, Christian theology. So it, it gives you sin to fight. It, it, it's inequity, basically, right, in all these different categories. It's oppressors. And um, then it gives you a solution that varies over the last 150 years. Sometimes it's economic, sometimes it's identity-based as it is today, but that's right. It gives you a problem and it gives you a solution. And the solution is to become uh, an anti-oppressor. And the late stages of this involve uh, rejecting any stable sexual identity altogether. And yes, basically creating your own identity. So. Wokeness, ultimately, it seems like it's like white people are bad. It is that, but it's also <laughs> a different theology. It's a different system. It's a different worldview where there's no stable meaning of humanity itself. And you, you say who you are. You follow your own heart. And we all know how dangerous that is. So, yeah, good words. Thank you. That's a good question. How do you help girls who are from fatherless homes and are now living through that chaos? Well, we have to know that where there is real brokenness, there's real brokenness. And there's not, as we've said a few times, going to be a button you push, you can push, that just magically makes that go away as a past experience. And there are even effects, profound effects, that will be operating in a lot of those girls' lives, just like in boys' lives. But what you can do is you can teach them the Christian worldview. You can give them the biblical gospel. You can be a loving Christian in their life. And you can just, you can pray for them, and you can, you can do everything you can to, to show love to them. And I'm guessing, I'm guessing a lot of you have sorts of ministry like that in big ways or small ways, but that is tremendously consequential. And, and you, you have no idea how God will use even several hours a week or something like this. I don't know how many you have, but with these young women in, in difficult straits. So... 
if we could just set the world to rights, <laughs> that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? If we could just, Bethany and I were flying here, and there was, there was a woman who we later learned was the grandmother of this tiny child on the plane, and probably in a tough situation, probably caring for a child who wasn't cared for otherwise, it, it seemed like that. But this, this woman was just so mad at this child. The child's crying on a plane. Children are often scared of planes, right? And, and children also disobey, so we didn't know exactly what it was, but just lashing out at the child verbally, stop crying, stop it, you know, and, and it was just this moment. Bethany and I were trying to just chat about our upcoming schedule uh, on this blissful opportunity to talk as adults for more than 16 minutes that I've already mentioned, and we're, we just had to stop talking because it was so, it was so sad. There's just such sadness and evil and devastation in this world, and we can't change it ourselves. But what we can do is be salt and light. And it sounds like that's what you're being. So go on and do not lose heart. Thank you, Dr. Strand. Um, this has been very enlightening. It's a long time to be here. You talked briefly about the reformers. Uh, obviously, this issue of, of blending church and state. Uh, and we're in this kind of community where I think we're really in the process of recovering a lot of biblical truth from what has been a period in the American church where we've been very lax on uh, basically everything apart from Jesus loves me, please serve me. And so obviously we have one level that's too far, maybe burning heretics, and the other level is far too permissive, wearing a rainbow stole in the church. And what I think we're kind of trying to figure out, at least what I'm trying to figure out, is this is going to be a pretty significant project that we're really undertaking. What would we say kind of is the line that we draw to see, I guess, how ecumenical can we be, right, when we're actually kind of going about the process of trying to, to set up maybe, you know, systems to, to serve us, our, you know, like the Christian community, but also going out and serving others. How do we know uh, not taking stock of that, you know, where, where do we make this, this uh, I guess the point where we say we can't work with you, where do we break fellowship on um, actually, you know, public service and Swiss? Okay, wow. You guys are deep uh, on a Saturday <laughs> afternoon. So I'm going to uh, hand it over to Kent, and he's, <laughs> he's going to come. It's time to close. Um, we... I think as believers have freedom to, in the public square, at some level, very carefully partner with those who have common concerns. So you've heard me voice this in a kind of implicit way throughout the weekend where I, I am a young, young-ish, young-ish evangelical who will say, like on Twitter and stuff, that we should not be neither left nor right, which is an extreme extremely common formulation today. I, I think you look at whatever the modern left and whatever the, the historic left and the historic right used to be, whatever that is, look at the modern left and what it stands for today. Look at the modern right. It's no picnic, but how at least on some key issues, it's not the same. It doesn't mean that, you know, groups, churches should become political activism centers. That's not what I mean. But I think I think we do have freedom in the public square to have um, co-belligerence with religious people and others who support a traditional worldview. So when I see, let me give you an example. When I see parents in Loudoun County, Virginia, a blue county, very wealthy, historically super Democrat, when I see on video, viral videos, one father and mother after another in expensive puffer jackets, North Face, march to a microphone and say, stop teaching my kids that they hate students of color or vice versa, that the, the white kids hate them. Stop teaching my kids that right now. I'm like, I'm interested in that. I, I'm not just like, well, it's too bad that there's not the gospel preached there. Well, I guess ultimately, ultimately it is, but I'll take truth where I can find it. So I would be a voice, Christians disagree over this, but I would be a voice who would say, let's be active in the public square. Um, 
let's elect the best candidate we can elect going forward, local, state, and federal. Let's, um, let's recognize, by the way, that every candidate we will ever have is a not ideal candidate. <laughs> Just think about that one for like 10 seconds. <laughs> There's never going to be Jesus running for office. <laughs> that wasn't actually supposed to be a joke, but it's true, right? I, I mean, he's not running for office. He's got the cosmos already locked down. So hear that? But in terms of your local Texas uh, race, he's not on the ballot. So uh, sometimes Christians today are shaming other believers, like, how could you not? Don't you want Christians to take over? I'm like, sure, uh, to have major influence, yes. But what I, what I most want in this fallen world is to stave off the darkness as long as I can, preserve what good in a civilization I can. It is a noble thing for Christians to fight for a civilization, I believe, um, to be salt and light. So those are some things I would say. I believe that we can be part of conservative movements in Dallas or in Arkansas. Um, on my social media profile, I'm not a political activist, but I'll support occasionally something. I'll try to. It means nothing to anyone, but I'll try to say Governor Sanders, Sarah Huckabee Sanders in Arkansas is, is supporting legislation against Drag Queen Story Hour or is uh, supporting legislation to ban uh, gender transition surgeries, which should happen everywhere. And I support that. And I don't think I have, I have now stepped away from Christian ministry or something like that. I think we need more Christians who, who are clear about these things. I think pastors and elders have to be careful from the pulpit, yes, but what I'm most concerned with is the church teaches the truth and then the sheep stand for the truth. That's, that's what I would say. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so my mom is not a question. I tried to stay in my seat. But my, okay. my heart was pounding and I knew that's when the word was made because I listened to a lot of questions. And um, uh, how do we maneuver? A lot of confusion, and we know where that's coming from. We get it up in so many ways. But um, I, I had to get up because my, one of my visitors is, um, is mercy with the two pictures of the church and the next location. And I have nothing of this but just from the word of God. It's going to leave you all of us. From Isaiah. Who formed you? Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk in the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And that encourages me, I hope you work with others as we continue to try to maneuver through. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was thinking of the Beatitudes as people were asking those same questions. So um, that was a great scripture passage to, uh, to remind us of, and I appreciate that. But I would just commend to you all as well, Matthew 5, with Christ's promise. For example, Matthew 5, 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So when we walk through that fire, we will not be burned. And of course, that ultimately means in spiritual terms. So, man, what a blessed time, at least for me. I won't speak for you. That's me. So I've loved this time with you. Thank you for your attention and your energy and your dedication all the way to the end. Thank you to the elders for having me. And um, I'll just say a prayer and then hand it over. Father, thank you so much for these 
Dear men and women, brothers and sisters in the faith, I ask that you would bless them and strengthen them. I ask that you would help us to be faithful to your word. I pray, Father, that you would indeed walk with us through the the deep waters, through the fire, and I praise you that you will get us all the way home. It is not dependent on us to get ourselves to the gates of glory. You will take us there by your grace. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.